It is our custom to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of the priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us concerning the things we note. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. It is Memorial Day, and I have a poem here by Kelly Strong, a retired sergeant, it looks like. And this is the poem. I watched the flag pass by one day. It fluttered in the breeze. A young Marine saluted it, and then he stood at ease. I looked at him in uniform, so young, so tall, so proud. With hair cut square and eyes alert, he stands out in any crowd. I thought how many men like him had fallen through the years, how many died on foreign soil, how many mother's tears, how many pilots' planes shot down, how many died at sea, how many foxholes were soldiers' graves? No, freedom isn't free. I heard the sound of taps one night when everything was still. I listened to the bugler play and felt a sudden chill. I wondered just how many times that taps had meant amen when a flag had draped a coffin of a brother or a friend. I thought of the children of the mothers and the wives of fathers, sons, and uh, of fathers, sons, and husbands. Uh, I'll do that again. Of a brother or a friend, I thought of the children of the mothers and the wives of fathers, sons, and husbands with interrupted lives. I thought about a graveyard at the bottom of the sea of unmarked graves in Arlington. No freedom isn't free. And that's the truth. Freedom's not free. People have died as a substitute for us on battlefields, and they're doing it right now today across the world. So now we begin, we go back to Galatians. Galatians 1.8. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians 1.8. Galatians 1.8. Galatians 1 8 and 1 9 represent something called a double anathema. Anathema means curse. Double anathema. This is a double anathema. In the Bible also, it talks about anathema maranatha. Curse it till the Lord comes. Many churches name themselves maranatha, means the Lord comes. I've always been tempted to just to go put some graffiti in front of it and put anathema. You're cursed till the Lord comes, because all you're doing is going through prophecy. But anyway, this is a double anathema. Galatians 1.8. But even if we or an angel from heaven ever preach a gospel contrary to the one we have already preached to you, keep on being accursed. That's the first curse. It's the first curse upon the legalist. When false doctrine is taught, therefore, the minister, in this case the Apostle Paul, has the responsibility to make it clear that adherence to false doctrine means cursing for anyone who adheres to it. And anyone who adheres to faith plus anything is cursed. Anyone who says faith plus invite Christ into your heart is cursed. Anyone who says faith plus lordship is cursed. And Paul is going to make it clear. Now this is tough language in the Greek. You're accursed. That's tough language. Who wants to hear that they're accursed? But they are. He's talking to the Galatians. He's saying, you've fallen for prey for this legalism. You are accursed. Well, that's tough language. Then in one nine, this is what makes it a double anathema. He repeats himself. As we have said before and keep on saying now again, linear action, sorry. He keeps on saying it. As we have said before and keep on saying now again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, keep on, linear actions are, 
keep on being accursed. The second time he mentioned it, why? Well, he repeats it and he says, I'm going to keep on saying it. What he's doing, and we would put it this way in the English, we would say, I have no intention of taking this back. Yes, I've insulted you, and I'm not taking it back. It also means, no, I'm not mad, I'm not angry, I'm teaching you a point of doctrine. By saying it twice, Paul is saying, I've thought about this. I've thought about it, I've run it through my mind, and I've decided that I'm going to repeat it, and you are accursed. And I'm not taking it back, and I'll say it twice, to your face. And it's not a result of anger, Apostle Paul's in fellowship. Yet, he looks at the Galatians and says, you're accursed. In this case, he writes to them. Now as we move, that is the double anathema, 1A and 1-9, double anathema, cursing on legalists. Legalists are a curse, and we are to avoid them. There's blessing by association, and there's cursing by association. You hang around with people who think it's faith plus something. You hang around with people who think it's spirituality plus something. They are accursed, and you'll get a whiff of it. Now in verse 10, Paul takes a diversion. And he's going to take a diversion to, in order to defend his message of grace. And Paul must defend his ministry because the Judaizers have been using a public lie to get at Paul. They've been using a public lie to get his congregation to turn against him. The fastest way to get a congregation to turn against the pastor is to create a public lie. For example, oh, that pastor, he teaches grace. He will corrupt the children. Keep your children away from that pastor. He's corrupting them. Same thing happened with Paul. Same thing happens to every doctrinal pastor. Keep away from that fellow. He's going to corrupt you. No, he's not. He's going to give you doctrine. But ignorant people go in that direction. And those ignorant people are anathema. And they have a double anathema. And while they might get away with it and think they got away with it for a while, God's wrath is going to come on down on them like hot coals, eventually, in his time. You mess around like that, you will be punished. And so these legalists were messing around like that. Don't listen to Paul's message of grace. He's corrupting your children. But it was hard to get at Paul, very hard to get at Paul, because Paul rarely took an offering. He's like me. I don't take offerings. A little thing over there if you want to. You don't have to. And Paul never begged for money, so it was hard for them to really get at him, so they had to think, how are we going to get at this man, Paul? He comes out and teaches for free. Only thing he does is teach doctrine. We don't like the doctrine he teaches. We believe something different. We need to get at him. And how are we going to do it? Well, they're slick, and they came up with a way. And so this is what they criticized. They criticized his physical appearance. They couldn't cr really criticize the message. They criticized his physical appearance. He was short, bald, and had a big nose. And they criticized him for his appearance. He was short, bald, had a big nose, and they also criticized his public speaking ability. Apparently, he had a high, squeaky voice. At least according to uh, some of the extra-biblical sources, Paul had a high, squeaky voice, so they made fun of the way he sounded, and they made fun of the way he looked. And that was how they started getting at Paul. And it was a roundabout way to really rip apart his message. They had a hard time getting at the message, and in order not to be foolish, they said, well, we'll just attack his looks. And then they even attacked the fact that it was free. Paul taught for free, and they went around and attacked him for that and said, you know what? His messages are so bad. His public speaking ability is so bad, he doesn't even charge you for it. The same uh, accusations have been leveled at my pastor. He doesn't even charge for it because it ain't that good. It's not even worth paying for it. Now, in the ancient world, they paid for good oratories. They paid for it. It was part of their entertainment. In the Greek world, well, you would go to, a, like going to a concert today, you would go to hear someone speak and hear their wonderful speaking ability, and pay for it. But Paul wasn't there to be a great order. He was there to give them doctrine. And they didn't understand that. They're going to attack, attack, attack. And they couldn't attack the message, so they attacked his looks, they attacked his speaking ability, and then went so far as to say, he doesn't charge for it because it's that bad. It's not even worth uh, a dime. Now in 110, 
In 1.10, because of all of this, in Galatians 1.10, the Apostle Paul has to defend himself. And he says, Am I now trying to persuade people? Am I now trying to persuade people? What does that mean? That means by using a type of gimmick, any type of human gimmick, or to win over by false means. Am I trying to persuade people or God? Or am I trying to please people? This is very important. Because in, impro in approaching the gospel, Paul is not trying to persuade man. And you think, but when you give the gospel to somebody, aren't you trying to persuade them? You aren't. God the Holy Spirit will persuade them. And that's what Paul is saying. And he's keeping himself free from gimmicks. A lot of evangelists have gimmicks. You believe in Christ, you'll be happy forever. That's a lie. It's a gimmick. Or they have a dog and pony show. I remember some evangelists came to my school when I was in middle school. Uh, they were some type of team of muscular men. I forget what they're called. They're probably not even around anymore. But these muscle men would get up and bend bars and all like that and say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Rah! That's a gimmick. And then they would say, come to this church and hear our message. And they had to use, get, use gimmicks to get people to come listen. And Paul is saying, I'm not using gimmicks. I'm not handing out candy. I'm not hiding Easter eggs. I'm giving you a message. I've never used a human gimmick. And he's never used any type of human salesmanship. And when it comes to giving the gospel, you don't have to use salesmanship. God the Holy Spirit will do that for you. You don't have to sell somebody on the gospel. Just give them the facts. God the Holy Spirit will, will reveal that to the unbeliever if they're positive. And if they want to believe, they'll believe. Now when he says, or am I trying to please people? This is important. If you have any type of approbation lust, that means approval lust. If you have any type of lust of trying to please people, you shouldn't be anywhere near a pulpit. But most pastors today are people pleasers. And they think that the job of a pastor is to please people. Not to reprove and correct, but to please them. To make them feel all warm and fuzzy inside and let them have a nice, wonderful day at the church. No, it's for reproof and correction. And the pastor's job is not to please people, as Paul says. See, they're attacking Paul left and right, and he says, Am I trying to please you? Have I ever asked for money from you? Have I ever tried to persuade you by a gimmick? only thing I've done is get up and preach you a gospel, the gospel of Christ. So you'll never get anywhere in the pulpit if you have a tendency to want to please men. You can't please everybody. Somebody's going to be unhappy. And most pastors fall apart. As soon as somebody's upset, displeased, they're going to fall apart and say, Oh, I have to please so-and-so. If you base a ministry on pleasing people, you'll fall apart. And I'm giving this to you from Galatians. He says, I'm not trying to please people. Paul was not an entertainer. He was, a, a, he was an apostle. He wasn't an entertainer. You know, if I wanted to be an entertainer, I'd go do something else. I'd have played the violin. That's entertaining. Being a pastor is not designed to be an entertainer. Your job is to lay it on the line. As a pastor, your job is to lay it on the line and let people take it or leave it. They can believe it or get the hell out. And that's a fact, and that's the way Paul put it on the line. He said, you believe it or you get the hell out. I don't care if you believe it or not. I'm not here to please man. I'm here to do a job as unto the Lord. And we will note, by the way, the Apostle Paul did not even have a, a great guns ministry until 30 years after he was saved. Most people think of Paul as being saved and then suddenly he's a great apostle and going all around the world. It took him 30 years before he even really got involved in his ministry. For 15 of those years, he had a limited job to a very few amount of people. And then suddenly God opened the doors and people flooded in from everywhere and he went everywhere. It's all about God's time. And people want stuff to happen overnight and it's ridiculous. The more I study about Paul, the more I see how ridiculous it is. So the gospel, what is the gospel? The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It's not my power. It's not your power. And some people like to beg people to be saved. And they try to use their own human power. And they try to use gimmicks and everything else. But the gospel is the power of God. It's not your power. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It's not the power of a personality. 
You might say, how can you have a personality like that and win people to the Lord? Very simple. You give them the gospel, and if they want to respond, they'll respond to it. It has nothing to do with personality. And people who are personality-oriented are in the cosmic system, and they don't know straight up from straight down, and they would end up like this. If, they, if you think you need to be a pastor, and you think you want to be a pastor, and you're going to man-please, and you're going to walk around and uh, tiptoe on eggshells, and you're going to tell people uh, that... Uh, uh, you're going to try to make it all nice and flowery and say, well, this is the way it needs to be. You can't teach that way. You have to teach this way. You are not like Paul. You are like the legalist of Galatia. You were like the legalist who went into Galatia and started saying nice, sweet things to seduce the people. And the people were seduced. It has nothing to do with personality. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The power is the gospel. It's not you. It's not human personality. It's not human dynamics. It's none of that junk. And it is junk. That's human power. So Paul is really not going to be nice in any of Galatia, to Galatia whatsoever. No man can continue in a ministry if he wants to be pleasing men. The issue is what does God have to say? The congregation then has a choice. Will I believe it or will I not? The pastor gives the information, the apostle in this case gives the information, and the congregation can say, I believe it or I don't believe it. Now you can fail not to believe it, and that's up to you. Now in most churches today, pastors are man-pleasers, and even Hollywood promotes this type of junk. You watch a movie in, uh, on uh, something produced by Hollywood, they show a pastor all smiles, sweetness, and light. That is not a pastor. That is a man-pleaser. And most pastors today are man-pleasers. I'll rub your back, you rub mine. I'll give you a sweet message, you keep me as pastor. And yet they still don't. There's still conflict. And pastors don't even last one year. And they are men-pleasers, therefore they hop from church to church. They hop from hospital to hospital trying to please people. And that's not their job. Not to be a man-pleaser. And how do I know? Because Paul said, am I here to persuade people? Or am I trying to please people? No. That is not the job of an apostle or a pastor teacher. Then he said, if I kept on pleasing people, let your actions start. If I kept on pleasing people, but I haven't. If I kept on pleasing people, but I haven't. I would not be a servant of Christ. The job of a pastor is not to uh, serve people, but to serve Christ. And the only way to serve Christ is to lay it on the line and to give it to you to take it or leave it. Not to force it on you. You can take it or leave it. It might feel forced upon you, but you don't have to come back. You take it or you leave it. And Paul always taught in that manner. And you can't tiptoe around the truth. And Galatians really brings this out. You can never tiptoe around the truth. Then in 1.11... Galatians 1.11. But I keep laying it on the line to you. You might have something in there about certified. The Galatians can't be certified in anything. They're attacking Paul. They're in reversionism. And, and because they're in reversionism and because they're attacking Paul and because they get so upset, he's going to have to lay it on the line to them. And Paul's going to get very personal with them. But I keep laying it on the line to you. That's personal. To the Galatians. But I keep laying it on the line to you, royal family of God, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. Now what we need to know is that the legalists are leeches. Everywhere Paul went, and he set up a ministry, he would go to Galatians and set up a ministry. And then the legalists would leap, uh, latch on to it, and they became leeches. And then they would try to destroy Paul. So the legalists would only go to where the gospel had already been preached. They were trying to build on another man's foundation. And that's wrong. Apostle Paul had set a foundation and they tried to build on it. But what they were building was wood, hay, and stubble. What they were building was a deck of cards. And Paul is going to blast it out of there. Blast it. And that is the operative word. Paul is going to blast it the Galatians, to kingdom come. So the gospel is not according to the norm or standard of human viewpoint. That's what it means when he says, I preached 
that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. That means the gospel is not according to the norm or standard of human viewpoint. You might want to write that down. The gospel is not according to the norm or standard of human viewpoint. That means whenever you go out to witness, make sure all human viewpoints put aside. Only thing you need to do when you witness is to make it clear that Jesus Christ died as a substitute for that person. God the Holy Spirit will do the rest. You don't need to beg, and you don't need to come up with clever stories. Only thing you have to do is give the gospel, and that's the only thing Paul did. Yet these legalists came along with their clever stories and all types of man-pleasing activity, and it really threw the Galatians for a loop. So when you give the gospel, it's not like being a car salesman. When you try to sell a car, of course, you're going to try to build it up the best you can. Look at the beautiful paint job. It looks brand new. Look at the inside. Look at the leather seats. Isn't it so nice? It, doesn't even, it smells like a new car, doesn't it? They even spray new car smell in it. It smells like a new car. looks like a new car. runs like a new car. Yet it was in some flood in Florida. But you're a salesman. You're going to sell it. It, was, it went through the hurricane and the ocean went up in it and everything, and it's destroyed. But now you put a, a nice, a shiny face on the car. That's not the way it is when you give the gospel. You don't have to shine up the gospel. It's just fine the way it is. You don't have to add to it, take away from it. Just give it the way uh, you're supposed to give it. Believe in Christ and you'll be saved. So you lay the issue on the line. You give people the facts of the gospel and that's it. And you don't try to man please. There's application to you. For example, maybe you work in some place and your boss has indicated that uh, they need the gospel or have indicated that uh, they want to know what you believe in some way. So what do you do? Well, it's your boss, so you water it down. You're a little scared, a little timid. Well, I'll water the gospel down in this case because I might offend that person and lose my job. Nope, you got to put it on the line. If they've indicated an interest, and they seem like they need to hear the gospel or want to hear the gospel, you give it to them and you lay it on the line, you don't care if they get mad or not. Most people like to man please. You know what that means? You're ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You might have some friends in high school. Have you witnessed to them? Have you told them to believe in Christ? If you haven't, why not? You're ashamed of the gospel of Christ. That's why. And you, uh, you don't want to upset your friends and you don't want to uh, lose your friends. Lose them. You don't need them. And who knows, maybe they will believe in Christ. Maybe they'll become your best friend. Lay it on the line. Lay it on the line is what Paul says. Now in Galatians 1.12. Galatians 1.12. For I did not receive it or learn it from any human source. Instead, by means of revelation from Jesus Christ. This is true for Paul. No one even witnessed to Paul. Well, people might have tried to witness to him, but they, he wouldn't have listened. Jesus Christ himself witnessed to Paul. For I did not receive it or learn it from any human source. Instead, by means of revelation from Jesus Christ. Now, Paul here is going to use his own experience. Now, what, it, what does it mean when it says receive? In the Greek, it actually means that he welcomed it as a host would welcome an honored guest. When the Apostle Paul heard the gospel from Jesus Christ, he didn't, even, he didn't just receive it, he welcomed it as if it was an honored guest. He opened the door and said, come on in. And he believed in Christ right there. So Paul received the gospel on the road to Damascus from Jesus Christ and not from a human source. And what did Jesus Christ do? He made it clear. He made the issue clear, and he didn't try to sell the gospel. He just made it so clear Paul went blind. And uh, that's kind of tough, but Jesus Christ made it so clear to Paul, Paul went blind for three days. And so Paul did not even receive the gospel from a human source, and what he's saying is, I'm not giving this to you from a human source, and I'm not trying to please you. I'm trying to tell you the truth and lay it on the line. Now in Galatians 1.13, Galatians 1.13 For you have heard of my former lifestyle in Judaism. Correct the translation. For you have heard of my former lifestyle in Judaism. 
How I kept on persecuting linear action start again. How I kept on persecuting the church of God to an extreme degree and wasted, sacked, and ravaged it. For you have heard of my former lifestyle in Judaism, how I kept on persecuting the church of God to an extreme degree and wasted, sacked, and ravaged it. So Paul was actually, as Saul of Tarsus, was the greatest persecutor of the early church. He persecuted it. If you, if you were to walk up to Paul and say, I'm a believer in Christ, he would just as well stone you to death and would probably arrange it so you would be stoned to death. That was Saul of Tarsus. He was the most zealous of the Jews. And as Saul murdered thousands of Christians, he became truly the greatest sinner of all time. And what we need to note is here is the greatest sinner of all time, the Apostle Paul. Yet when the gospel was made clear to him, he believed it. The worst sinner of all time. And then the gospel was made clear and he believed it. And, our, and the only way Paul would believe it is if Jesus Christ gave it to him himself because no one was qualified to give the gospel to Paul. He was such a genius. He was so zealous People would try to man-please Paul because he was in authority, and people would be scared of Paul, so it took Jesus Christ, the only one not scared of Paul, to give him the gospel. Peter would have never chose Paul to be an apostle. Peter would have never witnessed to Paul. Peter would have said, Saul of Tarsus is a lost cause. I would have said it. We all would have said it. He was the most religious man ever. I would have looked at Saul of Tarsus and said, he's so religious, there's no hope for him. I would have looked at him like Osama bin Laden, and so would, so would you. You would say, here's Saul of Tarsus, killing Christians, just as Osama bin Laden likes to do. And uh, are you going to go over and witness to Osama bin Laden? No, I wouldn't either. Nobody was qualified to. Nobody would do it, because they figured he was a lost cause. But who knew he wasn't? Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ himself had to give him the gospel. And as a result, Paul believed. It was the only way Paul was going to believe. He was positive. He was just so loaded down in religion, he needed a kick, a big kick from Jesus Christ himself. Now, what happens in uh, most churches is confusion. At the end of a service, people will respond in confusion and start weeping and maybe walk forward, and they don't know what they're doing. One time my pastor talked about going to a Billy Graham meeting. He used to, look, he used to work closely with Billy Graham, and he would go to a Billy Graham meeting, and at the end of the service, uh, some people would walk up to him. He was one of the workers there and say, and, and he would talk to him and say, well, did you believe in Christ? And he said, no, I don't think I did. And he said, well, why are you crying? He says, I want to get back with my wife. He got all emotional and thought that believing in Christ or walking forward would get him back with his wife. And so that's confusion. And in confusion, people do not get saved. So the Apostle Paul was not going to be confused on the issue. That's why Jesus Christ gave it to him straight, and then the Apostle Paul welcomed it. Now, from the human viewpoint, no one would have voted for Paul, and no one would have given him the gospel. Therefore, Jesus Christ had to. Now, in Galatians 1.14, Paul continues to talk about himself in Judaism. Correctly translation. And I kept on profiting and advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my nation, being extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Paul was very zealous in religion, the most religious man on the face of the earth, and that made him the greatest sinner on the face of the earth. The greatest sinners today are the most religious. Now Paul advanced in the Jews' religion. Why? The more he persecuted the church, the more he advanced. The more he persecuted the church, the more he was promoted. And every time he was promoted to authority, he was given the authority to persecute it even more. And it became a vicious cycle until Paul had gone to such an extent he had persecuted and murdered thousands upon thousands of Christians. He kept being promoted. Why? Because of his zealousness. He was zealous for religion, very zealous. Now, Paul was the most religious man ever, as we've noted, also found in 1 Timothy, as the greatest of all sinners. 
Therefore, it's not the one who goes out and raises hell that's the worst of all sinners. It's not the one who goes out and gets drunk and commits fornication and does all of those things that are shocking to you. It is the religious people that are the worst of sinners. It is your relatives who are very religious who are the worst of sinners. It is my relatives who are very religious, and we all have them, that's why I can say it, who are the worst of sinners. It is the legalist who is the worst of sinners. It is the sweet little Baptist woman in the church who is the worst of sinners. You say, what about the prostitutes? No, they're not the worst. The religious people, the legalistic people, are the worst of sinners, whether believer or unbeliever. And guess what? They are what? Under a double anathema. They are doubly cursed. And this is why Paul comes down so hard on religion and so hard on legalism because he used to be one. He used to be religious. He knows how blinding it was. It was so blinding he had to go blind before he realized how blinding it was. And he had, and he finally, and Jesus Christ himself had to reveal himself to Paul before he realized that he was really in bad shape. Now what made Paul so religious? Look what it says. Being extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. He was zealous for tradition. He loved tradition. And he followed tradition. He followed the holy days. He followed it to a T. He memorized the Old Testament. He was so zealous, many uh, believers today would look at him and say, he must be saved. And he wasn't. He was just zealous for the law. And he was zealous for tradition. What's that mean? All traditions are related to religion and legalism. Do you miss your traditions of your former churches? Do you miss uh, going to an uh, Easter Sunday rise service in which you can dress up and put on your Easter hat and look for Easter eggs? You miss tradition. You miss religion. Do you miss Halloween when they all give out candy and so the little children can be safe on Halloween? And Do you miss that? You miss tradition. You miss the religion. Do you miss the uh, chicken dinners after church? You miss tradition. Church is not about tradition. It's about learning the word. And there's nowhere in the Bible where I saw Paul holding a chicken dinner. Nowhere. No potlucks, no nothing. First Corinthians didn't start out. I, Paul, come to you with peace and a potluck. Nope. I, Paul, come to you with a chicken leg. Nope. I, Paul, come to you with fun and games, with a dog and pony show. Nope. What did he come to us with? Doctrine. And what does he hit the Galatians with? Doctrine. And what do you need? Doctrine. Not fun and games. There's enough fun and games in America today. We need a turnaround. And on this Memorial Day, the best way you can remember the troops is to be right here learning doctrine. And uh, because people are here with listening to doctrine, maybe even this, just this little bit, you might not think of it as much, but this, just this little bit of people here listening to doctrine, if, they really, if you really get with it and you really get to play Roma, just this much can deliver the country. It took Moses, who delivered two million. So just a few here and there is enough to keep the country going. So just because it's small, don't worry about that. Your impact can be great individually. So Paul was zealous for tradition and really into it, but he was knocked out of it. He's about to knock the Galatians out of it. Galatians 1.15. Galatians 1.15. But when it pleased the one who separated me out from my mother's womb, and called me by the instrumentality of his grace. And you say, how do you know that's the correct translation? Well, I know it is, and I'll give you part of it. But when it pleased the one who separated me out from my mother's womb. I know that's correct. I looked it up today. I looked it up to make sure it was there, and it is. Plus X 
plus koilea. Et plus koilea. It's in the Greek. I got a Greek Bible if you want to look at it. It means out from, out from. Et, out, out from. Et, out from, plus the womb. Et plus koilea. And he was separated out from the womb. And that's when life begins. And that's the way it is always found in the Bible. I haven't found one place in the Greek where it's otherwise. I haven't uh, seen in plus koilea, en plus koilea, always ek, out from. Not in, but out from. Out from, out from, all through the Bible. And it makes sense because just as, this, just as we must be born again spiritually, we are born physically. It, it, it makes total sense. I know emotionally it may not, but biblically it does. It makes perfect sense. So, uh, 114 and uh, 115, But when it pleased the one who separated me out from my mother's womb and called me by the instrumentality of his grace. Now what we must notice is here is God who is pleased. God is pleased. And how is God pleased? Well, we need, need to look at three points of God's pleasure. Three points of the pleasure of God or God's pleasure. Number one, God is pleased to save those who believe. 1 Corinthians 1.21 God is pleased to save those who believe. 1 Corinthians 1.21 And that's part of the pleasure of God. And he is pleased that you believed in Christ. Number two. God is pleased to appoint his son as Savior and to reconcile the world to himself. God is pleased to appoint his son as Savior and to reconcile the world to himself. Colossians 1, 19 and 20. God is pleased to appoint his Son and Savior and to reconcile the world to himself, Colossians 1, 19 and 20. Number three. Number three is a negative, what God is not pleased with. Number three. God is displeased with Old Testament offerings. God is displeased with Old Testament offerings. God could never derive any pleasure from the Old Testament offerings. People did. People in the past derived pleasure from the Old Testament offerings because it was a teaching tool to teach them about the salvation work of Christ and to teach them how to rebound. And so people derived pleasure from it because they learned doctrine. You see, many people in the Old Testament could not read. And so the priest would perform these ceremonies to teach as a teaching aid. And, and we don't quite understand it, but that's the way it worked in those days. And so while it pleased man, because man would learn from it, it could not please God. Only the work of Christ could please God. And that's found in Hebrews 10, 6 through 8. God was not pleased with the Old Testament sacrifice, but pleased with the work of Christ. In Hebrews 10, 6 through 8. But when it was pleased... But when it pleased the one who separated me out from the mother's womb and called me. Now Paul was earmarked to be the twelfth apostle. He was called to be the twelfth apostle. And of course we noted the sanctimonious prayer of Peter and the election of Matthias, which was nonsense. Matthias is never mentioned again, and Matthias is not the twelfth apostle. God appoints the spiritual gift, as we noted, and Paul was earmarked to be the twelfth apostle. Now Paul was under attack by legalistic forces, so they immediately attacked his apostleship. Why? Because when they first came to the Galatians, the Galatians said, well, Paul here is an apostle. What is your uh, rank? And they were very interested in rank. Paul established himself as an apostle. What is your rank? So they had to attack his apostleship, and that's exactly what they did. Now we need to note that Paul was chosen by God in grace. Out from my mother's womb and called me by the instrumentality of his grace. It was the grace of God that called Paul, of course. 
Only grace can call the worst of sinners and turn him into the greatest believer ever. Only grace can do that. And grace can do it for you too. You might think lowly of yourself and you might think of yourself as not too great of a believer. God can take the scum of the earth, as Paul was, and turn him into the greatest believer ever. How? Grace. But you have to follow grace. You have to follow the grace system. So never think lowly of yourself because you can grow in grace and knowledge just as Paul did. Now we know that Paul was chosen by the instrumentality of his grace. We must note something. Paul was chosen by grace. And the Galatians used to believe in grace. But in uh, Galatians 1.6 it talks about how the Galatians went AWOL from grace. And when the Galatians went AWOL from grace, they went AWOL from the man who was chosen by grace. When they went AWOL from grace, they went AWOL from Paul. Why? Paul chosen by grace. Paul was the man for the job. And when they slipped away from grace, they slipped away from Paul. If you slip away from doctrinal teaching, well, let's look at 1 Samuel 8.4. 1 Samuel 8, 4 is a good indication of how things go. It wasn't that the Galatians had rejected Paul. The Galatians had rejected grace. And because the Galatians had rejected grace, they rejected Paul. They blamed Paul, of course. It's the only way they could get out of it. And they say, oh, Paul's a bad speaker. Paul's funny looking. Paul's corrupting the children. Paul's doing this, that, and the other. They attacked Paul, but what they were really doing was attacking the message of grace. 1 Samuel 8, 4. 1 Samuel 8, 4. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, You are old. Aren't they rude? How many people do you go up to and say, You are old. It's rude. But they said to him, You are old, and they are rude. And your sons do not walk in your ways. That was true. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. And that's a wrong right there. We're, they were a client nation to God, and their king was the Lord Jesus Christ. And they wanted another king. They had rejected uh, Christ as their king, in other words. We do the same type of things when we say, um, uh, for example, we want to be like Europe and have uh, nationalized medicine, or Canada and have nationalized medicine. We don't need to be like other nations. We're the greatest nation in the world. We don't need to follow Europe into their degeneracy. But that's the way people think. You are old and your sons don't walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all other nations have. They want to be like all the other nations. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. It upset him. He was insulted. It's natural. He was upset. He had been their leader as a prophet for many years. He had delivered them from many terrorist attacks. In fact, Samuel had brought a modicum of peace to Israel for quite a while because of his influence as a spiritually mature believer. And now suddenly they say, we don't want you anymore. We want a king. It upset him because he knew his spiritual stance. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. Listen to them. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Samuel fell apart. Samuel got upset, and, Paul, and God himself had to straighten him out and say, Look, Samuel, these people aren't rejecting you. They're rejecting me. In other words, stop worrying about it. Stop being emotional. Stop being upset. I'll take care of these people. And then, of course, God allows people to have volition, and he allows them to have a king called Saul, who's a real stinker, and is going to get Israel in a big mess. So the same that held true for Samuel held true for Paul. Paul had been rejected by the Galatians, but they only rejected Paul because they rejected grace. 
and they rejected the one appointed by grace. And they started accepting people who were never appointed. They started accepting legalism. They started accepting people who would uh, man-please them. They started accepting people who would pat them on the back and tell them how good they are and tell them how they need to be circumcised. Then when they would get circumcised, they would pat them on the back and say, Welcome to the family, brother. They made them feel good. Why? Man-pleasers. So they went for the man-pleasers. Paul was never a man-pleaser. He just gave the message of grace, was a man of grace, a man selected by grace, so they rejected him only because they rejected grace first. You need to be careful. If, when, if you ever start to run down a minister, be careful as to why you're doing it. Because sometimes maybe you're doing it because you've rejected the message of grace. Maybe you're doing it, well, maybe you're upset about something, but you really are just simply rejecting the message of grace. And if you're at a church where the pastor's not teaching anything and then you run him down, that's stupid. You just don't have to be there. Leave. You don't have to listen to crap. You don't have to listen to me. What I teach isn't crap, but you still don't have to listen to it. You don't have to listen to anything, so why even talk about it? But see, the Galatians had went in that way. They had to justify what they were doing. And so they blamed it all on Paul. Now let's look at Galatians 1.16. Galatians 1.16 is God's purpose for Paul's work. God had a purpose for Paul, and he has a purpose for Paul's work. And this was the purpose of Paul, to reveal his son in me. Of course, the apostle Paul had the indwelling of Jesus Christ, as we all do. And his purpose was to re reveal his son in me, so that I could, let your actions start, keep on preaching. The purpose for Paul's work is to reveal his son in me, so that I could keep on preaching about him among the Gentiles. Among the Gentiles is dative, to, uh, dative of advantage, which means it's for the advantage of the Gentiles that they hear this. Then he goes on to say, I did not go to ask advice from any human being about what to preach. Apostle Paul never sought advice from any human being, ever. Now what... What we need to get out of this is that people are always ready to give their opinion and their advice. Always. But one of the advantages that Paul had was that he never took any advice from anyone. The <laughs> only thing he got was straight from God the Father. He had that gift. That's not to mean anyone should receive advice. This is the Apostle Paul. He got it straight from God. But what we must note about Paul is that he took no advice. He got pure doctrine straight from God. He didn't take advice. Now, for some people, if you don't take advice, it's a sign of arrogance. But in the case of the Apostle Paul, he didn't need it because he had the gift of knowledge and God's going to pour it out on him. And Paul's theological training came straight from God because he had the gift of knowledge. I don't have the gift of knowledge. No one does. And God does not wake me up in the middle of the night and pour out doctrine in me. God the Holy Spirit might, but then I have to go study. It's not something that just occurs as it did with Paul. Galatians 1.17 Nor did I go up to Jerusalem. Well, that's a good thing. Why? Because in Jerusalem, it's filled with legalists. He did not go up to Jerusalem, and it's a good thing because Jerusalem is filled with legalists. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before me. But right away, I went to Arabia and then returned to Damascus. And he stayed in Arabia, and that's where he had his theological training from God himself. So what did Paul do when he got saved? Right away, he went to Arabia to study. And God revealed him the doctrine right there. Paul's training for the ministry was in the same manner as Moses. Remember, Moses went into the desert for 40 years. That's where he received his training. We don't know exactly how long Paul stayed there, maybe 12, 13 years in the desert to receive training. Uh, Galatians 1.18 Then after three years, that is three years in Damascus, he was in the desert, then he went to Damascus, Galatians 1.18.
Then after three years in Damascus, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and stayed with him 15 days. He saw Peter for 15 days because that's all he could handle of him. That's a joke. That's not true. I don't know if that's true or not. It might be, but that's extra biblical. No extra charge either. But the reason why he really went to Peter was because Peter was in the leadership role. And he was in the leadership role because he kind of propped himself there. And everybody recognized Peter as a leader because he put himself in that position. And Paul's about to take it right from him. Not yet, but eventually. And then in 119, But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother, the Lord's half-brother. And why did he see James? Because James is the leader of the Jerusalem church. He saw Peter, the self-appointed leader of all the apostles. That's the way Peter's personality was, power-hungry type personality. He gets straightened out. And then he sees James, and he sees James because James is the leader of the Jerusalem church. Then in 120, take note that before God, I am not lying about what I'm writing to you. And Paul had to say this in defense of himself because the legalists were saying, Paul lies. Legalists were saying, oh, he's a liar. But the fact is, the legalists were the ones who were lying. They were lying about Paul. And they do. And what they did was kind of like what they do on Channel 6, talk about dreams and visions they've had, build themselves up into a, a self-righteous lather. I have had, I, uh, they talked about the gift of knowledge they've had when they've never had one. And uh, this, they were the ones lying. And so Paul had to write and say, look, I never lied to you one time. Never charged you, never lied to you. I simply taught you doctrine. 121, afterwards I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia. 122, but I was unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. Note, Paul has now been saved for up to about 13 or 14 years, and he's unknown. Unknown as a Christian, unknown. Unknown in terms of his spiritual growth. Many people who become believers right off, they want to be known, they want to have the approbation, they want to be thought of as great. For 13 years, Paul, the Apostle Paul, the greatest apostle ever, was not even known. Unknown. Now, no man can have a successful ministry without preparation. And the Apostle Paul had 13 years of preparation. You say, where's your preparation? 16 years of daily study. Some 365 days a year, 16 years daily study, sometimes 3, 4, 5, 6, even seven to eight times a day. That's where I got my preparation. Much better than Dallas Theological Seminary. Much better than any seminary. Guarantee you. What you're getting here, you will rarely get anywhere else. I say rarely. There may be some others. But not daily. Paul has been saved up to 13 to 14 years and still unknown. And I'm not in competition. The reason why I teach you daily is not out of competition. The reason I do it is out of love for you. I want you to grow in grace and in knowledge. I don't do it to be weird. You might think it's weird. What do you want to do? Come here and teach daily. It takes me a lot of preparation to get up here and teach daily. Why would I want to do it? Because I love you. You don't know it, but I do very much. And I want you to grow in grace and in knowledge. So Paul's been saved for 13 to 14 years. And he's been, he's, during this time, he's had preparation and nobody knows him. Same thing happened with David. David went through a great deal of preparation. One day we'll study David. Saul prepared him a lot. His, uh, his, yeah, that's a mess. We'll study it one day. Elijah for many years was unknown. Many years. Many of these people didn't get known until after their middle ages. Many of them didn't get known until their 50s and 60s. Unknown. Now the verb to be unknown is a present passive participle. And that means he was unknown in the past. He is con he is also habitually and constantly unknown as a believer. He was known as an unbeliever. As a believer, he's been habitually unknown. Why? He's been in a desert. He hasn't associated with anyone except God. 
If you become known as a great believer before you have any training, that is known by man as a great believer. And this is a big pitfall. You become known by man as a great believer. Maybe you have a wonderful spiritual gift of evangelism. And uh, maybe you haven't been studying as you should, and suddenly your evangelistic ministry takes off. That could be a big pitfall for you. Arrogance, approbation, lust. They asked Billy Graham one time, what is the hardest thing about being an evangelist? He said, arrogance. It's true. What a humble statement, too. He said, uh, you have all these people paying attention to you. It becomes easy to let it go to your head. For someone who hasn't been growing in grace and knowledge, any approbation lust will end up making that pastor a man pleaser, and he'll start hopping from church to church. You have to have preparation, and you have to be able to stick in one place, even if very few show up. You have to be able to do that, because this is what happened with Paul. Paul didn't start out great guns. In fact, when he did get started in the ministry, 13 years after his study, he had very, very small churches, and he wasn't even the highest leader at first. And then, eventually, God promoted him. But he started out very small with very little influence. In fact, Paul means small. He was small. He was short, bald, big nose, and some say pot belly. And that's Paul for you. With a high squeaky voice. So Galatians 1.23. But they had only heard, this is what they knew about Paul. Now Paul had been studying the word for 13 years and by now he is close to maturity. He's close to maturity. When he wrote Galatians, he was in maturity, but at this point, thinking back, he was close to it. Galatians 1.23, But they had only heard, The one who kept on persecuting us is now preaching the faith. That is the doctrine, the body of belief. He once tried to destroy, but they only heard, The one who kept on persecuting us, the church, is now preaching the faith, he once tried to destroy. Now again, Paul is the chief of all sinners. He's the worst man who's ever lived on the face of the earth. Paul is. And that's the only thing the Christians in the whole world knew about him. The fact that he persecuted Christians. That's all they knew about him. And they knew he was the most zealous man for religion and tradition. And they knew of, of him as a probably understanding the entirety of the Old Testament and being zealous for the Mosaic Law. And he was the worst person who ever lived. And now not only is he saved, but he's about to become the greatest apostle. Again, that's grace. So what you've screwed up in life? So what you've messed up? We've all messed up. Paul messed up. And Paul messed up more than on one occasion, and so will we. But through grace, we have the opportunity to become phenomenal believers. So as a result of Paul, who is now preaching the gospel, after and before preaching the gospel, he was killing Christians, now he's witnessing and bringing people to the body of Christ. As a result, 124, Galatians 124. So they glorified God, and this is the corrected translation, so they glorified God in the sphere of my ministry. They didn't glorify Paul, they glorified God. So they glorified God in the sphere of my ministry. Principle. Paul didn't see glory and he didn't get any either. When these people were saved and they realized that it was the Apostle Paul now who used to be the worst of sinners, when they realized this, they praised God. They didn't praise Paul and pat him on the back. He didn't deserve it. Now the religious Jews are running down Paul. The religious Jews are running down Paul. But what are those who are grace-oriented doing? Glorifying God. They're not uplifting Paul. They don't have to. People who are in fellowship glorify God. They don't have to talk about anybody. People who are losers run down other people. And so the religious crowd was running down Paul. And the grace-oriented crowd glorified God. You see, the grace-oriented crowd did not get in a fight with the crowd that was running down Paul. They ignored that crowd, and they simply glorified God. 
the uh, body of Christ is not for a bunch of fights. So if you spend your time gossiping about a pastor because of his personality or the manner he communicates, as they did with Paul, they said he was a bad speaker, they said he was ugly, etc., made fun of him, if you go in that direction, you're not glorifying God. In fact, in the Old Testament, there's one man, I forget his name, he was bald, and they all made fun of him. Do you remember his name? Who? Elijah was bald. Elijah Elijah was bald, and these, yeah, it was Elijah. And these kids, teenagers, came out and made fun of him because he was bald. But they weren't making fun of him because he was bald. They were making fun of him because of the doctrine he taught. So suddenly some bears came out of the woods and ate the teenagers. <laughs> Killed them. And that's what happens when you mess around with communicators of doctrine. And I don't say that for my benefit. I say it for yours. The only thing that happens to me when people talk about me is blessing upon blessing upon blessing. I say it for your benefit. I could just let you keep, not that you do, I'm talking in general. I just could uh, not even mention it and just have blessing, blessing, blessing. I mention it for your benefit. So tomorrow night we'll start with chapter 2, and it's the two battles against legalism. And this is where we, we really get into the situation. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we've noted. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.